first on our list is holy shit, is that what this is about? Nuns running a used car dealership? I mean, how good can this possibly be? I don't think I've ever been this happy. This is what happens when years of Catholic repression finally come to a head and explode in tandem with the mind that gave us Eddie's casket shop. Shut the hell up, goddammit! I mean, how else would you explain two hot nuns arguing over how to sell a convertible with the aid of a blow-up Jesus? This is a business, and a business needs to make money, and you are acting like a bratty schoolgirl! This is not the Jesus I know! And I just want to say that I am 110% behind this idea. <laughs> you can't just picture my chains hanging around people's necks. It took me three weeks to get that from Jesus Loves Me But Can't Stand You Novelties! And yes, I said, hot nuns. The original working title on the film was Holy Oxymoron Batman. We have had our differences, but we have always come together. Giggity! But seriously, if nuns looked like this back when I was in Sunday school, I would have been camped outside the convent in a lawn chair with a box of donuts. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Hiroshima, take two! Yeah! And then there's, of course, this scene, and I, uh... What the hell? I'm gonna go on a limb here and say that drugs were involved. Overall, this is a visual gag funhouse, with all the jokes hitting their mark, and of course, no sacrilegious musical would be complete without a director cameo. What's wrong with a Luxury. That's nothing. I have something just like it set up for the door to my office. Come in. Ah! Oh ah! shit, did I leave that on? Damn it, Blake! I'm sorry. What is the matter with <laughs> There's you? There's nothing wrong with me. Ah! You, on the other hand, have a bullet inside you. Doggone Day is a silent short about a cable repairman on a quest for the holy ass. Yeah, I bet that honey loves that sweet cable man pillow talk in the bedroom. Yeah, I know, baby. I can't wait either. I've been wanting you all day. Uh-huh. Yep. I'm gonna be home to inspect your box between noon and seven. Oh, crap! Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, is that too fast? Uh, don't worry about it, I DVR'd it. Now just imagine how pissed she's gonna be when he hikes her bill in six months without telling her. Any whore, before we can even get that far, LL Room Temperature J here has to make his last few calls of the day, and it's easier said than done. Where my bitches at? Right there on his phone. Speaking of which, I have a good question. How the hell did that woman manage to take this picture? This ain't your average Facebook self-shot. What, she rocking a GoPro helicopter? I mean, maybe if she had a mirror over the bed. It's kind of hot, actually. I'm just saying, if I were him, I'd want to have a talk with that photographer. Now I mentioned that this is a silent short, and it has the charm of a silent film, but I just wonder how it would play with the look of a silent film. A lot of space here, and so I thought I'd get a, um, a horse for Sue for her birthday. This is no yard for a horse. There's too much re rod. This is, this is horrible. If you get a horse, I will report you myself to the Humane Society. Why don't you get her a goat? Yeah, I can totally see how he went from point A to B on that one. I mean, who the hell has time for adopting dogs and cats these days? <laughs> YOLO! Talking about goat years. Woohoo! I'm just gonna cut to the chase on this one. This is one of the best documentary shorts I've ever seen flat out. It tells a really unique story about a boat yard in Detroit that earned its nickname from having this kooky ass goat running around. It's charming and funny. And it taught me a really important life lesson. Goats are assholes. Could spring straight up in the air 25 feet while well, he sprung up on this gentleman's boat and dropped some raisin nuts all over the place. If a woman left her purse, he would rummage through the purse, and he'd need a registration, he'd need any kind of paper, he'd need all the money. He could do some serious damage. And if that's not enough, this goat is addicted to cigarettes. He would nudge your cigarette pack out of your pocket. Yeah, but he's a Detroit goat, so he probably smokes menthols. Just think about it. Non-smoking people are normally a pain in the ass. People who are trying to quit smoking are like a bunch of Bruce Banners just trying to not lose their shit and crash their car into your living room. Now imagine a goat trying to quit smoking.
Tangeline, a state of being where one exists without purpose, living day to day, satisfied with the basic needs of life. Oh, great! This movie already doesn't live up to my expectations. I mean, when I see Protangeline, I expect to see a science fiction epic about a cybernetic fruit monster sent back in time to kill Monsanto. Now I know all you guys are like, political humor? You? The guy who pooped on the Killer Santa movie? Put it! But no, apparently we get a film about a cigar chomping bar owner from Sin City who likes to make his employees work on a Sunday. The only fucking rush you're getting in here today is Crackmore Mary and fucking Crazy Phil. Now I know what you're thinking, but those are just their screen names on Xbox Live. That's Crack or Mary? Looks more like Tina Fey after a mineshaft explosion. Or maybe the dead guy from Hocus Pocus. And that must be Crazy Phil. Shit, man, last night the c c cops were all over. He actually used to talk normal before he took a roundhouse kick to the face from Chuck Norris. That don't make no fucking sense. Any skank, all jokes aside, this is a really touching portrait of loneliness and kindness. And how over time, the rewards of one can alleviate the other. It's really Stan's birthday today, and uh, I just don't think he wants to spend it alone. But he doesn't think we know it's his birthday. Yeah. Shit, what time is it, man? Probably time to say fuck. Shut, Shut the, the fuck, fuck up! The characters all seem like people we know or have known at some point in our lives, but it really all boils down to Stan, who is awesome for three reasons. One, he drives the Ecto-1 to work. <laughs> Nah, I'm just kidding, he's only driving a normal Cadillac. But damn it, I can dream. Two, I keep wondering if he's ever gonna light that cigar. Seriously, it just hangs from his mouth like a slang term for male genitalia. And three... You know what your fucking problem is? Yes, I was just getting to that. Your fucking problem is you don't appreciate jack shit. Hey, hey, that's not true. I appreciate lots of things in life. Like... Beer! I love beer! Yeah! <laughs> There's not a door there. You know what else your fucking problem is? No. Pray tell, what is my problem, sir? You don't know how to shut your fucking mouth. Well, that's one theory, but personally, I think it's because I don't have a catchphrase as awesome as this one. You know what your fucking problem is? You. Now, you got a fucking problem? Hey, you know what your fucking problem is? You know what your fucking problem is? You know what your fucking problem is? I seriously want to get that printed on a t-shirt. Hey, buddy, how's it going? Nice shirt. Now, you have a talent, Mr. Arthur. A rather unique talent that brings you to us. A talent that we could all benefit from. That's what she said. <laughs> all right, let's just get one thing straight right off the bat. For those of you out there who are expecting me or hoping that I would analyze this flick and dissect it so that all of us once and for all could finally figure out just what in the fuck is going on in this movie i just have one thing to say to you we're in deep shit yeah basically i don't have the faintest idea what the hell is going on in this flick so let's just move on you had one job to do what i do know is that apparently don Cheadle's character in oceans 11 and will i am must have had some test tube baby and he's being interrogated by one of the pod people and cobra commander i also would have accepted the gimp from pulp fiction but the gimp's sleeping well, I guess you're just gonna have to go wake him up now, won't you? From what I can understand, the central concept of thieves is literal identity theft. Not the kind where somebody nicks your credit cards and uses them to buy three grand worth of Nigerian dildos. This is mine. It's the only freedom I have left, so long as I'm still considered a human fucking being. So conformity has become this literal programming and people who want to keep their individuality have become a band of rebels, I think. If an idea is no longer the property of its creator, would you consider any of us human at all anymore? A creature whose will is at the mercy of a so-called greater good? A greater good. Shut it! I do have one very important question, though. Do you have to pay Mr. T to use his haircut? I mean, does he get, like, royalties or something? A pit of the fool that puts me on this plywood. I didn't think they programmed you assholes with a sense of humor. Regardless of what it all means, the real triumph of Thieves isn't its story, but its execution. This is about as well-made as well-made can get on the cheap, and it was honored for its achievements by being named Short of the Year. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. You with the mohawk, you had a question? Have you ever made love? Oh, on a couch? I'd be stalking. Just once I wish the paying clients could be the good guys. No one is that luxury. 
Listen, we need to talk. Oh shit, I know that tone. Hey Garcon, any chance we can make this coffee more Irish? Yeah, you're useless. Certain Essential Elements tells the story of two relationships spiraling directly into the shitter on the same night, on two different floors in the same building. And apparently, all of this takes place in the movie Ratatouille. <laughs> what are the odds? And again, what are the odds you'd have a character drama that opens with its lead actress hiding from a Tyrannosaurus Rex? <laughs> Uh, 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 that's chaos theory. Lisa and Don are both married, but not to each other. No matter what he may have done, your husband is still one of my biggest clients and oldest friends. What do you mean by that? Well, I hope you sell lamps, because from what I understand, your bang buddy's husband, he really likes to <laughs> read a lot. Downstairs, Clay and Jana are breaking up because she got a new job. I'm going away. Going away. I got the job as head of the study abroad program. And for some reason, this makes him think about Lisa's rack. <laughs> wow. Raul. Of course! The two stories parallel each other as they progress toward their inevitable conclusions with the underlying arc that Clay is actually a private investigator hired by Lisa's husband to dig up dirt on her affair with Tony Soprano. Babbity boopy! Too soon. Fucking sarcastic sometimes just drives me insane! Hey, don't look at me like I'm the bad guy here. I'm not the one throwing things. Dude, haven't you ever heard of a FAKE THROW?! It's not far into certain essential elements that we surrender to the spell cast by the cinematography, making a strong case that Jeff Schultz just may be the best working DP in Michigan. <laughs> DP. This movie is gorgeous to behold. <laughs> now I'm keeping it, bitch. There's still no door there. It's just in. We're, we're receiving some new reports for uh, claiming that... The attackers are physically biting their victims? Don't you love how all great zombie movies have an old radio in them somewhere? We, 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 we have a butt. In the morning, cool weekends. FM. Weenie. Weenie. And the butt. And welcome back. I will continue to report as long as I can. Not sure what's happening Sounds like here, some but... bullshit. Wait, Pizza Dude? Haven't I heard of that chain somewhere before? Pizza Dude's got 30 seconds. Smush is a remarkably entertaining zombie short about a little girl home alone who finds a zombie stuck in the doggy door in the garage. I'm not afraid of you! Daddy told me how to use this! Yes, you heard me correctly. There's a little girl home alone during the zombie apocalypse and her father didn't board up one of the easiest access points to the house. <laughs> I guess they skipped over the zombie apocalypse chapter and what to expect when you're expecting. Eddie slut, this is one hungry ass zombie, and he's not too scrupulous about what he eats either. I mean, look at some of the shit this little girl feeds him. That's gross. You ever wonder what goes through a zombie's head in a movie like this? It doesn't get much more entertaining than this. Smut! But unfortunately, the pizza dude, yeah, he didn't make it to his next stop. Ah, come on, I couldn't find a place. Wise man say, forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for late pizza. You know these scenes are only sexy because of the sound design. More air! Right now cut the close up. Love Succinctly is a love at first sight fantasy about a writer named Kate who gets inspiration from... Jesus? Nah, I'm just kidding. His name is Steve. I was disappointed too. Hey, I have to go feed the meter. Can you watch my computer for me please? Then Steve does what anyone would do. He forgets all about his laptop and goes home. See, this is what happens when you spend too much time on the internet. Your brain takes a 140 character dump and you completely forget what you're even doing. What? She decides to look on Steve's computer to see where he went. But damn it, she doesn't know his password. All right, let's try guest. 
No way. Dude, our security is atrocious. I hope he deleted all the penis pics for his Plenty of Fish account. Of course! So in her endeavor to return Steve's laptop, Kate not only winds up visiting the Redford Theater, but also manages to pick up an entire posse of Gladys Kravitzes in the process, including a ukulele playing bum and a group of local photographers who like to stand in a circle. Is there a dead body in the middle of that circle by any chance? It's a whimsical tale and a darn good one. But this could be so much more than that. It is a quest. You must open yourself up to possibilities. I know one possibility she wants to open up to. <laughs> Alaskan Pipeline. I don't know what that is, and I don't want to know what that is, and if you tell me what that is, I'll slice your throat. This flick is classic witchboard formula. You remember those movies? Although I must say that the reason this short works for me is mostly because I'm a whiny little bitch who's still piss scared of Ouija boards. Come on, Kate, get your hand on there. Giggity! What color underwear am I wearing? <laughs> Wax on, Wax off. White? Whoa. That's right. So the Viking Al Borland wears tidy whities Am I the only one who saw that coming? <sighs> What color am I wearing? Aw, oh, damn it, who invited this guy? All the women are gonna get roofies in their Christmas stockings this year. <laughs> None. <laughs> no comment. Forget it, I'm not gonna sit in your lap. The group contacts a spirit by the name of Zach, and they start grilling him with 20 questions about how he died. Did it hurt? No, no, not at all. You know, a plane crashing into a building and exploding into a ball of flame. It tickled. Shut up. But the story really takes a turn for the worse when the spirit gets a hard on for Little Red Riding Hood. Kate, Zach. <laughs> wow, Kate, something really likes you. Now I know I just conjured you, and this is crazy, but here's my body. Possess it, maybe? <laughs> what I really love about this is the idea of using spiritual conjuring for practical purposes, like finding hidden stashes of pornography in your home. Girly girls for manly men? Oh my god, that was so embarrassing! What the hell was that all about? Whatever, woman. I don't even look at porn while I'm sleeping. The director makes sure to let us know from the get-go that Oracle is based on true events. But somehow I think his own Ouija board sessions went a little differently. If there's someone here, give us a sign. Not again. Oh, shit. No, 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 no. Do you have any idea how devoid of creativity I would have to be to use the song Unforgettable to review a movie called Unforgettable? Unforgettable. You know what's ironic though? The movie Unforgettable. Yeah, the one with Ray Liotta, the one that all of us forgot about. You see, it's ironic because it's called Unforgettable and yet we all... Shut up, my mom says I'm funny. Damn it! The gist of it is that Jake's wife Sarah cheated on him with his best friend and she decides to reveal this to him on a special weekend getaway. I just don't know what's worse. The fact that you were stupid enough to throw away what we had. Or that you'd be that cold to do it with someone that close to me. Yeah, you know, it, it just occurs to me that this is a comedy show. And this might be a little too heavy for that kind of thing. So, what do you say we liven things up a bit with some upbeat music?
there. Now, doesn't that make everyone feel better? Damn it, my mom lied to me. What's up, motherfuckers? Welcome back to the tank. I, I? If Florida is where old people go to die, this is where profanity goes on vacation. What'd you say, motherfucker? Turn to your right. Your other right. What the hell is he doing here? Did he steal Charlie Sheen's t-shirt? Now let's get some fucking soup going now. God, Stan. I didn't even say anything. Dude, Stan, I know you were pissed about the soup, but come on, did you have to throw the dude in county? You know what they make you do in county? Toss the salad. Hey, I heard that, you rotten asshole. <laughs> and look at this, they're tossing him in a cell with Donald Trump and Bob Marley. Guess he shot the deputy after all. It's a good thing I had time to toss my shit. We don't get the epic twist offered up by the first tank flick, but this installment is every bit as involving and hilarious as the original, with better cinematography and characters that are just as memorable. Did you know that during World War II, the Nazis invited Poland from the West and the Russians from the East. And what did the Allies do to us after the war? They gave us to the Russians. In Soviet Russia, subtitles read you. You gotta be fucking kidding me. As before, each character gets their story developed in between sit-downs with Detectives Kaufman and Lex Luthor. The bulk of the film deals with the alleged rape committed by Bob Marley and his ex-girlfriend being interviewed for her side of the story. I'm not going to spoil anything, but let's just say that by the time it's all over, you'll only have one thing to say. Holy shit. Alright, it's not over yet. I know that I'm going to get chastised if I don't do this, so here we go. If you'll notice, there were two Ring of Fire pictures that won the Audience Choice Award this last year. So, without further ado, here's the short, condensed version. Protanculine 2, Electric Boogaloo. Check this out. You know what your fucking problem is? Fuck you. Fuck dog. Fucking fuck. Fuck fucking fucking. And your goddamn point is? Fuck. Fucking motherfuckers. You fucking dumbass. Fuck. Fuck fuck fuck. What the fuck did he just say? Fuck you. Fucking fuck. Fuck. Fucking fuck. Fucking fucking. Motherfuckers. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck, fuck you, Mendel. Fuck us. What the fuck you say? Fucking fuck. Fucking fucking. Fucking fucking. Fucking miserable bastard. What you say? Yeah, I heard that, you smart ass. Or fuck you, fucking. Fuck him. Fuck, fuck you. Fuck, fuck you, you know what you shit. Fuck, motherfucker. You fucking motherfucker. Are you fucking kidding me? Fucking, fucking, fucking fuckers. Fucking motherfucker. Fuck, fuck you. Fucking, fucking. Fuck, fuckers. Fucking, 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 fucking motherfucker. Fuck, 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 and I honestly don't think I can go out on a higher note than that. So thank you all for watching. You stay sexy, Mitten. So in her endeavor to return Steve to his laptop, or <laughs> laptop, here's Steve. Here's your human. I found him wandering on the street, <laughs> just masturbating on a street corner. Should really keep an eye on that. Okay, Mac? I'm assuming it's Mac.